Hello, Beverly. Thank you so much for being on the podcast with me today. Hi, Jill. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, I am. I am so, so excited because you are uh, in my neck of the woods, you know, in New York and you're in, um, I guess, you know, we're in the same field in the sense that I'm a nutritionist and you're a medical doctor. But, you know, what what our work is as nutritionists is helping women to manage their weight and lose weight, and maintain the weight loss, you know, whatever it is that they their desires are. But from a whole world that um, actually I never learned about through nutrition education, but I actually ended up going to um, an obesity um, conference mm. put on by the Obesity Society. It was the Obesity Society, right? The, the um, conferences, the Obesity Medical Obesity Week. And we'll also do that too. Obesity Week is by the Obesity Society. Okay, so. okay, good. <laughs> I want to make sure I got the right name. Yeah. And, you know, opening up a whole new world, which I had learned about a little bit around obesity. And, and you know, I knew going in that obesity is is a um, medical diagnosis. It's not a personality flaw, <laughs> which yeah. you and I have talked about. But meeting people like you who are actually obesity medicine physicians. So not just... Um, you know, your primary care doctor who, who may or may not be able to help people with this, of course, but somebody who really specializes in this and, and also uh, your background coming from endocrinology, you know, being a, an endocrinologist. Um, so this is a whole world that I really want to introduce people to is that um, there are real people doing real research in this area. It's not these uh, crazy fly by night, like I was telling you about, you know, uh, supposed magical pills or yeah. uh, in my town, there's a woman who who's a, a medical doctor who does weight loss, mm -hmm. but it's very different from the work that you're doing. And so I was so happy to mm -hmm. um, learn about that and get to know you and your, some of your colleagues. So today, thank you for being here. Sorry, it's a long introduction, but thank you for being here. And um, I wanted to just start off because you had mentioned talking about access, that research is getting, we're getting a lot of things researched well right now, but not the access is becoming a real issue. So tell us about that, what you mean by that, and um, what's going on in the, in the field right now in that regard? Yeah, maybe it's helpful that I set the stage a little bit, give a little bit of history of, which, you know, I think most of uh, listeners know the history of weight loss interventions and all the tips and tricks that you meet up with out there. Um, I think for the longest time, we thought of weight issues as a lifestyle problem. Some people call it like a morality issue too, which is, I always thought a little bit weird, but um, mm. yeah, for the longest time, we kind of pushed this treatment, so to speak, of lifestyle, like eat, eat less, move more. Mm -hmm. And if that's not working, it means you're not doing enough. And that's been the messaging to society for so long. That was born out of just a, a misunderstanding of what obesity is. As you mentioned, obesity is truly a medical disease, just like that of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, other chronic diseases. And that isn't to say that the lifestyle choices we make doesn't affect obesity. It just means that there's multiple components to it. So you don't have full control over it just by dieting and exercising, that there's genetic issues, there's a hormonal factor to that that also determines a person's weight and determines whether they're susceptible to having excess weight. And so because we really have been pushing as a society the wrong treatment for so long, this is why we have something like the obesity epidemic that just keeps getting worse and worse, right? Fortunately, over the past 30 years or so, uh, scientists have done a lot of research into understanding just the basic physiology of how do we regulate our weight, just like mm -hmm. energy in, energy out, why, when are we hungry, when are we full, um, there's a concept of the body weight set point, you know, mm -hmm. many people will say I've been, you know, 150 pounds all my life, and then this life event happened, Right, pregnancy or menopause or a job change or whatever it may be. And then now I'm like above my quote unquote weight set point. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of uh, understanding now about our short and long term, what controls our short and long term energy statuses. So 
because of that, we recognize that a lot of how our body regulates weight is through all of those different hormones. And I think, you know, many of my patients actually come back and say, well, duh, that's what they've been saying all the time. A lot of my, since I'm an endocrinologist, I have so many people coming in saying, you know, something's wrong with my hormones. I keep gaining weight. I feel like I'm exercising and doing all of the quote unquote right things. Um, but there's something's wrong with my hormones. Mm. Now we know that that's true. It, yeah. it is a hormonal issue. Uh, and so the medications that we've des- uh, developed over the past 30 years based on that hormone research addresses that hormone problem. Mm. So now we're seeing a point where I like to kind of parallel it to high blood pressure, for example. Mm -hmm. A lot of Americans have high blood pressure. We typically recommend low salt diet, you know, lots of fruits and veggies, exercise, and all of that is great. But if you're doing all of that, or if you have um, limitations that prevent you from doing that to the best of your ability, then we usually recommend medications. Those medications will address the hormonal issues that are right. driving a person's blood pressure uh, still to, to levels greater than our goals. Similarly with obesity, we still promote healthy eating and uh, healthy lifestyles. But if you're doing all of that to the best of your ability and we're still not at our goal, then we recommend medications. So I think we're seeing a phase in our obesity epidemic now, uh, which is hugely, uh, I hate to to use this word because everyone uses it. It is a game changer because we too have medications that really address that hormonal piece that we haven't been talking about that hasn't been in the narrative for the past 50 years. Yeah. The problem now, Jill, I think, is that they exist out there in the world, but we just can't get it. Right? There's so many patients who really should be getting this medication, mm. but aren't offered the medication. Maybe because physicians who are not obesity medicine doctors uh, don't know how to prescribe it. Maybe their medical education didn't include obesity medicine, which is mm-hmm. very true. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there are numbers out there where they've shown that there's only only 1% of people eligible for obesity medicine edu- uh, medications are offered obesity medications, just 1%. Wow. If we had that percentage in any other chronic disease, everyone would be so upset. Imagine yeah. only 1% of high cholesterol patients have being on a statin. It's, it's a crazy thing to, to think about. And yet that is what we see with obesity. Now that 1%, why why is it only 1%? It's just so many different reasons. It's, as I mentioned, maybe the provider, the doctor just doesn't have the education or background to comfortably prescribe that medication. Um, Oftentimes it's an insurance issue. So the medications, the newest ones that are highly effective tend to be cost prohibitive for many patients because the insurance may not cover it or they're not covering enough of that cost. Um, and then number three, I, there may be some hesitancy on the part of patients as well, of course, because they've been told all their lives that they should, quote unquote, they should be able to control their weight by diet and exercise. And then suddenly there's a medication option. So I think there's still a little of skepticism, probably appropriately of like, should I be taking this medication? Is this the right decision for me? Is this a lifelong decision for me? So I think a lot of people are asking the right questions. Yeah. Wow. And then, and then you probably have to add to that list, the, the bias that's still so pervasive yes. that, that you talked about that we know uh, doctors are just as guilty of having that bias as any other American person. So um, I'm sure that has to be part of it right now that some yeah. people, you know, they're just not, not right. willing to. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I was just going to say we ran into that bias um, when there were shortages of some of these medications. And I think um, there's a narrative out there that people were using off label diabetes medications for obesity treatment, which we actually do. And we do it in an evidence-based and ethical manner. 
Um, but I think people were trying to push this message that people with obesity were like, quote unquote, taking away the medications from people with diabetes. And I think the media is pushing a false dichotomy because in my head, I think both of those are equally deserving of treatment. People can have both or one of those diseases. Treatments exist for both or one of those diseases. And who am I to say, or the media to say, that one is any more deserving of treatment than the other? Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. So when you talked about the hormonal issues, um, so I, I have to ask you, I, cause I've never asked this before of a doctor, but so, as, you know, someone who's a really a specialist in this, I'm very curious. So I, for, for so long, being in this world of helping people lose weight, have been it's been very apparent to me that the calories in calories out model, which has been promoted for so long, um, simply just, it wasn't working. So yeah. I've had a lot of clients who I've worked with and I know, I mean, yes, they might not be entering their food perfectly. Yes. They may be fudging a little, but honestly, <laughs> honestly, I, I, I could say with pretty high degree of certainty that, most of them were being a hundred percent honest with me. Like mm -hmm. we were honest about everything else. So there was no reason for them to fudge it. And you may have somebody who's, you know, 220 pounds, uh, five foot, I'm thinking of somebody in particular right now, five foot one. Um, so for those who are listening, that would be somebody whose BMI would be classified as, as being in the obesity range mm -hmm. and, um, eating, you know, eight or 900 calories a day and not losing weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my choice as a nutritionist is, is a, well, you know, she's just making up stories. She's, she's, you know, eating stuff at night that she's not telling me about, but that that's not true. It really is not true. Yeah. And so I just, uh, like you said, you know, would always be questioning, you know, is, is it hormonal? Is it insulin? Is it thyroid? Is it sex hormones? Is it now, we, you know, learning all about these, these other hormones that the new medications are, are going after, uh, the GLP-1 and all of that. What's your thought on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Calories in, calories out. Is, does it, is it real? <laughs> so, um, there's a nuance to that because the calories in, calories out, is the correct answer to a different question, right? I think a lot of people ask, why do I have obesity or what causes obesity? And then the answer for all these years, the wrong answer was calories in, calories out. Calories in, calories out is true as its own standalone statement, but it's really answering more of the question of what is my weight right now? just as a physical number, what is my weight right now, today, February 15, is determined by maybe the average calorie in, calorie out over the past one week. That's, that's kind of, it's more of a description. The calories in, calories out answer is a description of weight, really. It doesn't really give much of an explanation as to why is my body continuing to gain weight. Why is my body um, predisposed to holding on to weight and making it so difficult to lose weight? If you think about it, this calories in, calories out is missing the whole black box of the actual body. Right. And that's, I think, what we have been missing this whole time, that we think we can just oversimplify it. And to a degree, if you eat small amounts, you know, if you if you do really, really small amounts and you exercise a lot, yes, it can sort of um, make the black box, our body kind of meaningless because you're doing such extremes. But what the research has been doing for the past 30 years was looking at that black box. Like what happens when we have that calorie in? Where does it go? How does our body decide whether it goes into our fat storage or does it go into our muscles or organs to be used up? How does it decide whether um, it goes one route or another? And also, how does that calorie affect our brain and, the, and our relationship to food? Does that calorie make us feel full 
Does that calorie make us feel hungrier the next time? Does that calorie stimulate a craving for a different calorie? So I think those are the kind of black box questions that we've been uh, sourcing out. And that is where you have the answer to what is causing my weight gain. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I love that. And I, because I, I've, you know, written out a list of things yeah. that I've personally seen medications. Yeah. I've seen, you know, definitely the hormonal stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've also noticed something very interesting the quality of the food, the calories, let's say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, that someone could be eating a, you know, so-called isocaloric, right? Like so basically the same amount of calories coming in, but when they're predominantly coming in from processed, highly processed foods, ultra, the, the term is ultra processed food, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So like a Velveeta cheese or mm -hmm. a white bread, you know, like highly processed white bread or hot dogs or, you know, um, I know you know this, I'm just kind of saying it for listeners, mm -hmm. um, even perhaps, you know, um, something that one might think is healthy, like a low fat yogurt with a granola bar, you mm -hmm. know, still ultra processed. Yeah. So I've seen this literally watched it happen where people went transition to eating more whole foods, predominantly whole foods, eating around the same amount of food. And then now they're actually, things are moving and they're feeling, you know, they're feeling more energy and just better. And, and the weight is, is moving as well, the body fat. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's a whole, you know, that's a whole world um, that to me as a nutritionist is like totally fascinating and exciting. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There's so much we don't know. There's so much we don't know. Once the calorie comes in, does your body decide to burn it or store it? Maybe it does depend on the other preservative stuff that's around ultra processed foods. Maybe that does have yeah. to do with how it affects our brain appetite centers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with Kevin Hall's study on ultra processed foods where it was shown that the same, given the same meal of like the same amount of calories in that meal, yeah. when um, given as ultra processed versus whole foods, people who were given the ultra processed meal, same number of calories, ate, I think 300 calories more, it was either three or 500 calories more. Um, and so there was something about how the ultra processing, I think, didn't satiate the brain centers as well. Yeah. And it prompted people to eat a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. And there's the whole thing also about fiber, which have, of course, again, uh, you know, yeah. Fiber is, I always say fiber is your friend <laughs> because, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's satiating, it slows things down and, and we don't really absorb the fiber, you know, yeah. it gets eaten up by our bacteria and, you know, we poop some of that out and it's all, you know, nice. So, and even just like the, the whole thing around cellular, so-called cellular and acellular foods. Yeah. So just the process of breaking down yeah. those, those walls, right? Those cellular walls. Uh, more work for the body, yeah. uh, you know, you're actually burning a little bit more calories there. So there's, there's a lot around just that topic. So what's interesting about this study is that they did control for fiber. Uh -huh. Technically, there was actually the same amounts of fiber in each group, in each meal. Um, but I think what the hypothesis was, was still to your point that that texture piece of having to like chew more mechanically, having mm -hmm. that feedback, um, just breaking it, spending more time breaking down the food in the whole foods plate versus the ultra processed, which tended to have like softer textures just because it was more processed. Um, and maybe there was like a speed component where yeah. you were, were just physically able to eat more in a shorter period of time before your app, before your brain kind of said, oh, you're full. Right. Um, so yeah. I, I actually think Hall did show in a subsequent study that that hypothesis was true, that the texture of the meal determined the speed of eating and the amount that they ate. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. It's so interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. I, I'm glad that we talked about this because, um, it's, it's important, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, there's so much around this topic. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much, but I never really have had a chance to talk to an expert essentially about this, you know? Um, 
So there's the calories in, calories out. Uh, obesity is a medical condition. What about overweight? Um, so I definitely encounter a lot of women who maybe their BMI is 27, 28, 29, or even 24, 25, and mm-hmm. they want to lose weight, <laughs> yeah. which is fine. You know, I, then it's really, I say it's about body composition. Yeah. You know, you want to maybe build up some muscle and maybe burn some of that fat, but you may end up being the same weight. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's, let's set that aside. But even people who are in that overweight category, is that a medical condition or is that, do we look at that? I would say the majority of data out there says that it is not in of itself, unless Mm -hmm. it's a kind of pre-obesity state. So, in a way, it is a bit of a risk factor, a marker. Like if you have overweight at this point, then you are at a higher risk of developing obesity Let in the see. next 10 years than someone who has a normal BMI at that time. Mm-hmm. The problem is that we don't always know who are those people who are actually going to develop obesity and then the medical complications of obesity. There are people who just stay in this overweight category and they never actually develop obesity, and they never actually develop medical complications. And that means if you're in the overweight category, you're fine. We don't mm-hmm. need to treat that. We don't have mm-hmm. to treat it number. Yeah. And also there's the whole conversation around how BMI is not a very reliable tool yeah. for, for clinical, you know, it, they use it for research and everything, but... Yep. I mean, there are there are a lot of NFL football players who are in their 20s who have a BMI that I'm sure would be 28 or something like that, just because they're muscular. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so true. BMI doesn't account for that body composition. So yeah, there's a lot of limitations to BMI. Yeah, but you know, I mean, it's it's something to think about. Okay, so I'll say, Jill, though that mm-hmm. that um, to a point of access, the yeah, the one kind of population where I would be very cognizant of that overweight BMI category are um, certain ethnic populations. So like South Asian and East Asian in particular Mm -hmm. tend to start to develop medical complications of weight at those lower BMIs. Even if someone's Mm -hmm. still in the overweight range, they may already have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, or prediabetes. And those are individuals where you definitely want to consider offering medications Mm -hmm. um, or offering some sort of more uh, aggressive treatment. And so when you look at our, um, you know, the Obesity Society guidelines, that's co, that was co-written with the AHA and ACC, the guidelines do recommend considering anti-obesity medications for people with a BMI of 27 plus a comorbidity, 27 okay. or greater plus a comorbidity, not just those with a BMI of 30 and greater. So okay. even the society guidelines put in that allowance, recognizing that what's more important here is that comorbidity piece. Right. If we already see a medical complication, then we do want to treat now. When you look at those BMI thresholds in some of the Asian guidelines, um, all of that is kind of kicked down about two and a half points. Mm-hmm. So you want to start recommending that at you know, 24 and a half if you have a comorbidity. Yeah. And so this is something that probably your regular primary care provider might not even be aware of these guidelines. Yeah, points. that's definitely right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, the access, the, the really, I guess, dissemination of information, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> I think yeah, every doctor should, because Think about it. Any any medical doctor who's sitting in their chair right now meeting with a primary care doctor is going to be seeing people with obesity or Asian people, you know, who fit into that category. And they're and it's just street. They're just streaming by and they're and they're not getting the care that they need. And that that's yeah. heartbreaking. I mean, you know, the stats, it's like 60 percent of people have overweight or obesity in the U.S., Right. And I think that was from like 2014 or 2016. So we're, we're yeah. probably more than that now. And that feasibly means that two out of every three patients you see in clinic, a physician sees in clinic, will have obesity or overweight. Yeah. And that is every doctor. Now you could be a surgeon, you could be an OBGYN, you could be psychiatrist, nutritionist, mm-hmm. any person you see in your office, two out of every three people will have overweight or obesity. Mm. That's significant. Yeah. What about 
the people who, uh, again, like I, I think of a, a lot of my clients who come to us there, you know, could be like a 57 year old woman who has really, you know, gained weight with, with menopause or for whatever reason, they may think it's from menopause. It may not be. <laughs> um, and you know, they have that extra 20 or 30 pounds and they're just like, they want to get rid of it and they're trying so hard and they can't. Mm -hmm. Do you think someone like this would be a candidate for, you know, if they went to someone like you uh, for, ob you know, the types of obesity medications that, that we've been talking about, like the, the responsible ones? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we love to see patients who want to be healthier, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I think what drives most people's motivation to lose weight is to just be healthier, be more functional, be a happier per version of themselves. Yeah. Um, and so we love to have them in our clinics and suss out, okay, are you a good candidate? Have we, tr what have you tried in the past? What has worked? What hasn't worked? What are you struggling with now? Is it, you know, the food environment? Is it cravings? Is there emotional component to your food relationships? Is the physical activity limited? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's, what are the issues there? And so, I love that you bring up a 57 year old menopausal woman because that's really who we see. On mm -hmm. average, our patients are 51 years old. The majority are women. They have um, class one obesity. So you have excess weight, but it's not it's so excessive that you can't be exercising. You don't, maybe you don't have knee pain yet or any of those other limitations. Um, and we always talk about medications mm -hmm. primarily yeah. because what they've done for most of their lives is the exercise and diet piece. And they've yeah. usually done that to the best of their ability. Absolutely. The first time they meet me is the first time someone's actually talking about how do we address those hormones. Right. And I think you spoke about it earlier, like thyroid, menopause, all of these things. I know people will hear about cortisol, estrogen, testosterone, and ask, like, are my hormones out of whack? And is this what's causing my weight problem? I can say for most of the people, I will say, yes, <laughs> there's pro there is a hormone issue. I just don't think it's thyroid because we can check thyroid. Right. Most of the time it's not thyroid. We can check testosterone. We can't really check estrogen, but I can say with my experience, with menopausal women, that it absolutely plays a role. We do know that estrogen actually suppresses appetite as a hormone. So when we lose that, or when we have fluctuations in estrogen around perimenopause, we do see fluctuations in how we eat, whether that be manifesting as cravings or changes in appetite level. Um, but we, we do know that that occurs. Uh, there's a lot of changes in menopause, actually. I could go through yeah. a about that. Um, but a lot of the hormones that control our weight are not the ones that we can check in the blood. That's mm, the, problem, right? Right. the problem is that those hormones work in the gut or they work in the brain. So I can tell you that it is a hormonal issue, but I can't prove it to you because I can't check it in your brain. Right. Um, but I think most people are very much reassured by that, that yeah, there is a hormone problem and that there are medications that can treat that hormone. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, you know, I'm likening it to, you know, a 57 year old woman who tested, you know, had their blood sugar tested and they came back with pre, you know, the, I don't know if it's a true diagnosis, but pre diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. I get this a lot. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been diagnosed with pre diabetes. You know, they have a hemoglobin A1C of 5.8 or 5.9. Yeah. Like now, you know, most people would say, well, if that person desires treatment and desires to address it, then they should, right? And probably they would get the advice at that point to change their diet and lifestyle to mm -hmm. manage their blood sugar. But then if it wasn't under control after, you know, a year or something, six months, then they would be recommended some kind of medication. So right. we, we can almost put, you know, translate the um, so-called um you know, the category of overweight as pre-diabetes, right? Like their, yeah. their risk for developing diabetes is higher. Yeah. So why not, you know, address it? And like you said, I think most people at that age in their 50s have been, most women honestly have been paying attention to their weight since they were 
12 years old. So <laughs> it's not like this hasn't been addressed. You know, the blood sugar, I think, is not always, you know, people may not address it in the same way because they just mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah. Uh, you can't see it. You can't see your blood sugar. So yep. it's, it's harder to kind of piece that out. So, um, yeah. Wow. And, um, gosh, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much, but I, I love so directions from that. <laughs> I know. And well, maybe I'll just invite you back on. Um, yep. cause I know that you probably have patients waiting, you know, that are, you have to see today. So just before we wrap up, can you tell us a little bit about your practice? You're in New York because someone listening might say, Hey, you know, I, this sounds like something I want to explore. And I, I, I have told my clients about your practice. Um, but just tell us like what, what you all do and the name of your, um, so I, I work at, um, an academic institution in Manhattan while Cornell medicine as an endocrinologist. And I'm fortunate enough to work in a, um, in a group where I have other colleagues who do what I do as well as registered dietitians who are there to support our patients on the nutrition piece. We have a working relation, a good relationship with the institutions around us, including the hospital for special surgery and their exercise physiologists. So we have some support on that physical activity. And so nice. the way I like to think about it is this sort of three pronged approach for most patients who are seeking our care, where we're giving that nutrition support, the physical activity support, and then as their physician, we're giving that medical support to address the hormonal piece again. Um, we, of course, work closely with our gastroenterologists who offer uh, endobariatric non-surgical procedures. A whole other podcast can be done about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then we also work closely with our bariatric surgeons where we can offer uh, bariatric surgeries for people who would be really benef benefiting from that. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Okay. That's wonderful. Are you, uh, speaking of accessibility, are you, um, in network with insurance? Is the practice? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So that's really, really important for people, I think, to, cause, you know, there's so many functional medicine doctors and I think they're wonderful, but they're usually out of network. So this is amazing that, that we have, people have access to that. Yeah, it's, it's an accessibility problem. And I will, you know, be the first to acknowledge that I'm fortunate to have a wonderful, uh, patient population here, either locally. And we, we do see people kind of on video visits outside of the state as well, depending on our different, uh, licenses and who's licensed where. Uh, everyone who has come to see us have been so motivated and really committed to making health changes that it's really been wonderful to work with everyone. Yeah, yeah, that that's I think that's been some of the controversy around these latest wave of these these effective medications is oh now you're just going to give people a pill and they're not going to change their diet which happens with type 2 diabetes believe me I I have some people in my family like that. <laughs> yeah. Um so you know it's that's I I think I'm kind of reading between the lines here that you know I mean we, this is, should be a holistic approach and not just, Hey doc, give me a pill, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. holistic and, in, and individualized. I mm -hmm. think that people who are naysayers think exactly that, that we're just going to give medications to everyone, Yeah, but it's not about that. It's more that we're trying to help that particular patient group where they have tried everything and they still haven't been able to get to their goal. And now they have another option to do on top of everything else that they're doing. We yeah. still think lifestyle choices are important, right? but we also recognize that sometimes we don't have full control over those choices, right? If someone is working like 12 hours a day and they can't make a home cooked meal because they have to be up again in like six hours, then they may very well be eating a lot of takeout. And we recognize that that's part of their lifestyle right now, that they don't have control unless they quit their job. Right. That that's just not financially. Feasible. You know, there's a lot of just practical considerations here. And so we, we try to offer some other option to mm -hmm. help mitigate the damage, so to speak, of what our current modern environment is imposing on us. Yeah. Yeah. It's very compassionate. And I think that's, that's so important because there's been so much 
Uh, I honestly, I think of it as abuse. I mean, not only um, from the medical establishment of sort of seeing this medical condition as a as a morality or a personality flaw or something, yeah. um, but also just from this multi billion dollar industry, which has grown up around, well, you know, you're not thin and petite, so therefore, you know, you have to take our pill, magical pills yeah. and do this punishing workout regime or, you know, eat this highly restrictive diet or do all three actually probably. Yeah. Right? And there's all this money being made basically preying upon people's insecurities and fear. And, you know, I mean, it's really, it's, it's abuse and it's horrible. Yeah. So I love what you're saying is it's compassion. It's saying, you know, not everybody has the means or the capability to, you know, work out an hour every day and, yeah. and make everything home cooked. Let's help those people too. They deserve to be healthy too. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. And I really hope in like 10 or 20 years in the future that we start seeing obesity differently. Right now we define obesity on such a very physical and visible characteristic. As yeah. you say, no one else can tell that you have diabetes. But the way that we as a society and the medical community has defined obesity, it is a very visible disease, which has only added to that stigma. And that's, you know, historically been driven by, you know, BMI charts and all of that. But I really hope that in maybe 10 or 20 years, mm -hmm. we really start seeing obesity as what I would call a, a hormonal disease. Some people call it a neurohormonal disease because mm -hmm. it really has to do with how our brain processes calories. Does it make us feel full? Does it make us crave? Does it make us hungrier? And how our body decides what our weight set point is. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be visible, but that's really, I think, the crux of obesity as a disease. Yeah. So hopefully sometime in the future, people won't feel so tied to their appearance, they won't feel as much of that societal pressure to be skinnier or whatever it is, because they are able to dissociate their appearance, their weight from the actual medical pieces, the yeah. health pieces that they need to be focusing on. Yeah, I hope so too. I hope so too. Well, people like you are, are you know, really making a difference and uh, I appreciate that. And the Obesity Society and, um, Obesity Action Coalition, you know, trying to just raise more awareness around this. So we're trying, um, but you know, we can't do it without people like you either, Jill, when you're giving all the support and having a platform to have an open communication and conversation about it. I think that's also just as equally important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love, 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 love doing this. And the more, the deeper I get into it, the more I'm like, the, you know, especially because women, you know, I, our clients are mostly women and I feel like in, men and women have different issues around their weight and their appearances, yeah. but mm -hmm. there is so much tied to our, you know, our society has kind of trained us that our, our physical appearance now determines our worth. Yeah. So it's really hard on women, right? Because yeah. men can walk around with the extra 40, 50 pounds. They don't seem to care <laughs> as much as women. And, and so, you know, that's uh, not to make men, wrong or anything, but I think that it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a women's issue, women's health issue, um, yeah. specifically a lot of this stuff. So, um, yeah. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, who's a bit of an art buff and he was commenting how this has been a centuries long issue, like just the, the appearance, the focus on appearance. It yeah. was mentioning, I don't know what the painting is called, but it was a Picasso painting and it was a woman in all of the abstract shapes looking at another mirror, uh, looking at herself in the mirror. And the mirror just had a whole other different set of abstract shapes. And that's yeah. just kind of the crux of our humanity, I think, or our society, unfortunately. But I do hope that as we have greater and greater understanding of what it means to be healthy mm -hmm. and what that looks like, so to speak, yeah. or what it doesn't necessarily have to look like, and as you say, we have more compassion and we can actually progress forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great. Thank you so much, Beverly. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah. You're so welcome. It was wonderful to speak with you, Jill. I really enjoyed this. Okay. 